In the last video, we talked about different notions of price, including the equilibrium price based on an efficient market, the market price, which is the price of alternatives, which could have different sources, as well as the connection between the market price, the theoretical equilibrium of supply and demand, and different price indicators or references that might be available. Today, we're going to talk about commodities exchanges and the financial derivative products that are often offered on these. So if you remember last time, we were talking about the idea of a, an efficient market where supply equals demand, which needs perfect information, perfect access of all buyers to all sellers, things that in the real world out here just making transactions with one another is not reasonable. But there are ways to try to get a little bit closer to an efficient market. And one of the most important is through a commodities exchange. The purpose of a commodities exchange is precisely to bring together as much of the supply and the demand as possible to be able to transact in an open and transparent way and arrive at a price that gets as close as possible to an equilibrium, at least for the buyers and sellers that are present in that space on that deck. So on one extreme, you have atomistic exchanges where everyone is out there not talking to one another, determining terms and prices on their own without telling them to anyone else. No one has any idea what's a good deal or a bad deal. No one is aware of alternatives and what other prices and terms might be available to others elsewhere. You may have quite a diverse range of, of results and these good and bad deals for different actors create incentives for them to behave. And if those are quite diverse, they're going to behave in quite diverse ways. And that's not going to allocate resources in a way that meets society's needs as best as possible, which is theoretically what's supposed to happen in an efficient market. This is another one of these theoretical notions that I take great joy in tearing apart, but that's not what this is about, so I'll leave that for another day also. So in a commodities exchange, everyone comes with the product that they have to sell. Everyone who wants it goes to buy it there because that's where you go, that's where it's all coming. And when you bring everyone together like this, and information is shared openly, the idea is that everyone should get the same deal because all buyers and sellers are perfectly substitutable for one another. Ideally, there's no one-to-one -one negotiation or coercion. Rather, there are open offers, counter offers, acceptance of offers. There could be an auction or other similar formats. Importantly, when you want to bring all supply and demand together, there have to be product rules and standard terms so that one deal that one person got is comparable to another deal someone else got. Because if everyone is bringing something different and everyone else is looking for something different, we cannot very well standardize pricing and terms. In this way, that an exchange could help facilitate arriving at a price closer to equilibrium than what would be reached otherwise. Of course, the more widely it's used, or the greater portion of all the product bought and sold occurs through the exchange, the more efficient it will be. A, a functioning and widely used exchange that publishes prices could also lead to more market efficiency outside of the exchange. Because even buyers and sellers that transact with one, in, one another outside of the exchange, based on the prices and terms indicated there, have the option of going to the exchange if there happens to be a better deal for one or the other at the exchange than, than outside it. Now when there is this functioning exchange of buyers and sellers coming together periodically, and a process of arrival at a market price for a standard product, then something interesting can be done. This allows for the buying and selling not only of the product being referenced, but contracts or promises to buy or sell it. Here I'm talking about financial derivatives. Again, for those of you who don't know, the C price that we refer to or look up online and think of as the market price of coffee, this is actually the current price of the coffee future contract of the subsequent expiration. So this is why it's important to understand what a futures contract really is, because it's not the same thing as physical coffee. A futures contract is a promise to buy or sell at some known date in the future at a price that's decided today. In the case of the C price, this future contract has several expiration dates throughout the year, and these can be bought or positioned opened and closed at any time prior to their expiration. What's important here is that while coffee or any kind of agricultural or biological product 
is not going to be completely the same as any other one, every coffee futures contract is exactly the same. In that sense, any buyer can be matched with any seller on the other side because these contracts are completely fungible. The contract includes standard rules about the product and the delivery process. And the way this works for buyers and sellers, a long position is a promise to buy in the future, while a short position is a promise to sell in the future. This is the same as with company stocks. Shorting a stock, but this is a promise to sell that stock. In this case, it's not a share, but a contract with, it, with a clear expiration date. So if you open a short position with a contract with a certain expiry, you must sell at that expiry, the product that's indicated in the rules of the contract. If you open your long position, you must buy coffee at the expiration date of that contract. If one person opens a long position per promising to purchase coffee in the future, someone else must be on the other side of that with a short position promising to sell at some point in the future. So this is not like a casino or a, a racetrack where there's a house which will take the other side of your bets. In this case, the exchange only holds the bets or promises of the people on the other side of them. So if you want to make a long position, you have to offer a price and wait for somebody to take the other side. It depends on the exchange because each one has different rules. But at the IC exchange where the C price or the KC coffee contract is traded, People with positions don't necessarily need to exchange physical coffee at their expiration. Whatever the movement in the price from when the commitment to buy or sell was made to the contract expiration, this can be settled with cash by paying the difference or receiving the difference in cash, or the position can be rolled over until the next period at the next expiration. This is especially important for speculators who want to be able to participate in the risk and opportunity in this market but are not interested in, in having or selling green coffee. A forward contract is similar to a futures contract, but with a few differences. It's also a promise to buy or sell at some point in the future, but it's often much more flexible and can be arranged between two parties without needing to go through an exchange necessarily. The specific product rules are determined by the buyer and the seller, and the purchase or sale normally has to occur at the expiry of that contract. This is more often done between buyers and sellers that know one another. Even, for example, any time a roaster will purchase from an importer for delivery at some point in the future, this is known as forward booking, and technically this could be considered a financial derivative. Lastly, and very important in the coffee market, are options. Now, options can get quite complex, and it's not necessarily relevant to the question of how coffee is priced, so I'm not going to get into them right now. They basically work like insurance in that they can be exercised if necessary or not. There are some creative ways that they can be used for hedgers as well as speculators, but this is kind of technical and I don't find all that interesting, so maybe we'll pick it up another day. So getting back to the idea of efficient markets, how does the C price become the market price? Why is it that in the real world of coffee trading, no matter what type of coffee we're talking about, there's quite often reference to where, what the C price is? In order to determine what's a fair or appropriate price, for a physical product today. Now the legitimizing implication is that the C price is necessarily the equilibrium price where coffee supply meets demand and therefore we must use it as the market price or else we're going to have a surplus or a shortage and a misallocation of resources. Now we know that truly efficient markets are unlikely to exist just about anywhere and in the next video we're going to get a bit deeper into whether or not the coffee futures market could be considered efficient or not, uh, but we'll leave that to for another day. An alternative explanation of how the C price becomes the market price is simply a consensus. Not necessarily a consensus of the millions of individuals involved in buying and selling coffee, but a consensus of power. A consensus of enough of the in entities uh, that handle enough of the coffee in the global market, whether they know about the interests of one another or not, that we should be using the C price as the market price. In the context of financial derivatives, which are often used for hedging or protecting oneself against the volatility of the market, it makes quite a lot of sense why those entities which are involved in the hedging, which have access to the financial derivative products needed to do hedging, they want to buy physical coffee based on the same price that they're using to hedge. Of course, because if they didn't, well, the financial derivatives wouldn't be hedging against the thing that they're actually buying. And when there is a consensus, that believes that this price reference should be relevant, 
this critical mass of coffee trading volume believes that this is a fair way to price coffee or an appropriate way, well, this eliminates a good portion of the alternatives that could be out there. And in order to reach this kind of consensus, it doesn't necessarily need to represent the physical equilibrium of supply and demand. It's assumed that there is an equilibrium because there's a terminal. Like I mentioned before in the discussion of commodities exchanges, if one has the option of selling and buying coffee via the exchange, via the terminal market, this option always exists. So if you are out there making transactions with someone and they are charging you more than what you can get at the terminal market, well, you either go there and buy it. If you're selling something and someone is offering you less than you can get at the exchange, well, you will go there and you'll sell it. And in that sense, the physical trading that occurs at this terminal market should bring the terminal price and therefore the futures and deriv or derivative price back into equilibrium as long as the futures price, as it nears maturity, near its expiration date where the physical coffee must be bought and sold, if this, as long as this price converges to the spot price that people are actually buying and selling, then one could consider it efficient, in one sense. But this notion that both are, ef are efficient, if they are highly correlated with one another, assumes that they are both independently based on something else, market fundamentals. But what if one is just simply based on the other one? This is the big question I have today. It's assumed that the exchange itself is efficient because it brings together supply and demand, as we talked about. Everyone with all of the information that they're able to gather goes there and acts based on that information. The individual actions of quite a lot of people on both sides, all knowing about one another, all knowing the transactions that are taking place, should theoretically bring that market price at the exchange toward an equilibrium level based on the knowledge of current and future supply and demand conditions in the market at large. And if, for example, the C price were to deviate from the equilibrium spot price, if the spot price were more representative of physical equilibrium, well, this would create an arbitrage opportunity, as I mentioned earlier. If you can get a better deal by going to the exchange, well, you will go there, thereby eliminating the difference between the exchange price and the physical market price. If this works in such a perfect way, well, then everyone becomes a price taker because no one's able to influence the price one way or the other. No one can coerce their counterpart in a transaction into taking a price that's a worse deal than they can get at the exchange because they always have the option of just saying, no, I'm going to the exchange. Here's an example of what I mean by arbitrage, of taking advantage of the differences between the spot market and the exchange. So let's say we have this buyer here on one side, and he says, I'll give you $2. This could be any currency for any amount of anything, it doesn't matter. Let's say that he says, I will give you two dollars, and the seller says, no, I need two dollars and a half for this. Well, if the buyer knows that the exchange price is two dollars, well, then he'll say, no, I'm not going to take that deal because I can get a better deal by going to the exchange. And if that happens to every buyer that that seller is able to access, well, the seller will either have to sell for two dollars or have no buyer at all and end up going to the exchange and getting two dollars. This is not an this is not an example of actually doing arbitrage, but how having the option of an exchange could lead to consistent prices off the exchange. Let's have a look at another example. Say this buyer says, Well I'll give you one dollar and a half. Then the seller, either because they don't have access or they don't know that the exchange price is higher, they do it. They sell for one dollar and a half. Well then this buyer, recognizing an arbitrage opportunity, buys for one and a half and goes to the exchange and sells for two, making a half dollar profit. This is taking advantage of arbitrage. I started getting a bit carried away with efficient markets and arbitrage and all of this, uh, so we're going to have to stop the video here for now. My apologies if this was a bit theoretical and dense, but I think it's this density and complexity of this subject that makes it such a good way to manipulate people. Because it's so complex and sometimes difficult to really understand, it can be easy to just take it for granted, and this is where we get into trouble. So I hope we've sufficiently confronted this kind of technical aspect of financial derivatives and all of this. So in the next one we can get back into how this affects actual physical coffee negotiations that we're going to be engaging in, and know when it should apply and when it may not apply as much. And despite how tidy and organized and kind of calming this idea of perfect balance is, there are several aspects of the coffee trade and its relation to futures contract that I think really call into question this notion of efficiency and appropriateness. So please join me in the next video where we really get into this.